Good, man. How are you? Good. You've been busy, Just huh? Been real busy, yeah. Yeah. Nice. A lot of publications coming out, and then you got your book coming out too, right? We picked that up. <laughs> oh yeah, cool. Got got to flash that on the screen. Yeah, I just actually read the first chapter, man. So it's awesome. So looking forward to digging into it. Yeah, first couple of chapters are really heavy. This that's yeah. heavy science. So then it gets more practical. The uh, chapters three to seven are the more practical chapter. I'm still some heavy science, but the first two, especially the second chapter, is we're really with the pathways, metab uh, anabolic pathways. Right. Metabolic pathways or some heavy stuff. Yeah, the mechanisms. As you, can, I, as you can see, this guy is a selfish twin. He goes right <laughs> after the book. I don't even get a chance to get it, but I'll read it after him. <laughs> hey, there's time to share. I'm sure he's not on it eight hours a day. So exactly. You know, four gotta, hours a day. You, yeah, I got to sneak it away. There's only much I can absorb um, at a time. <laughs> you, you guys live together? Or? Yeah, we live together. Yeah, yeah, over here in LA. Everything together, huh? Oh man, stuck at the hip. Yeah, it's it's tough, man. If like you know, you talk to other twins, like we've talked to other twins, and it's kind of like the same thing, you know. Like it's hard to kind of separate. So, yeah, I don't think we're gonna do it anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be tough when one of you gets married first. Definitely, oh, man. Yeah. Unless, unless we find some hot twins, you know. <laughs> there, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Brad. So we always like starting off our <clears throat> podcast with just asking our guests, you know, pretty much. Who, who you are and kind of like your story in a nutshell, just to give our audience, you know, more background. Sure. Well, currently I'm an assistant professor in exercise science at Lehman College in the Bronx, New York. Uh, I was a trainer for many years. For 18 years, I own my own private uh, facility. But now, like I said, I'm in pretty much all in academia, although I still occasionally do consult uh, with some clients. Uh, I'm the head of the human performance lab at Lehman. I'm a researcher. My focus is on uh, body composition, on optimizing body comp, primarily muscle hypertrophy, but also fat loss. I have over 100 peer-reviewed papers uh, published and hopefully building on that uh, this, uh, this semester and the rest of the year. I'm an international lecturer. I speak uh, around the world. Uh, I do probably at least once a month I'm speaking somewhere. Uh, and I'm also an author. Uh, I published uh, 11 consumer books. And uh, my new book is a textbook, which I believe you guys have, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you can flash that if you want. So we'll show you guys what that. we're talking about here. What uh, just came out with right here. Awesome right. read right here. We'll plug this at the end. Thanks, bud. Yeah, it's the science and development of muscle hypertrophy. Really, that's the culmination of my career so far, and that really delves into the science of muscle hypertrophy, awesome. how to maximize it. Awesome, awesome. All right, so um, I was listening to the podcast you guys did yesterday with uh, Lay Norton, and that was actually a really, really good episode. And something that caught my attention was that you said that you used to be a, a business owner where you had your own personal training studio. Is that correct? Okay. Yeah. So what I'm always intrigued about is, you know, you went through that journey to have your own private facility, did all that work. So what, what was that time where you're like, you know what, I want to switch gears. I want to go into the education. I want to start doing – you know, being a professor, I want to be a speaker, I want to be an author, I want to further my education. Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, I owned my own facility for many, many years, uh, as I mentioned, for 18 years. I started when I was seven, that's why I look so young. So. <laughs> um, but, but seriously, I, um, I uh, really enjoyed my time doing that, but after a while I just wanted more. Uh, I, I really love the science, and when you're training someone, they really don't give to, you know, what's about the science. They just want to get in shape. They want you to get them results. And I'd be into explaining the reasons why this one exercise was working uh, one head of a muscle where another exercise was working a different head of the muscle because of passive tension and active insufficiently. And they would just say, okay, thanks. Now let's just get the result. <laughs> and over time, I just, uh, I just developed a fascination with, um, with science and education. And I gravitated towards uh, teaching, so I, I got a job in a, a personal training school where I was teaching aspiring personal trainers. And once I did that, I was hooked, and I decided this is what I wanted to do. And uh, I then uh, got uh, jobs part time because I only had my master's at the time. I got uh, adjunct jobs in, at the college level, and that's when I decided I needed my PhD because I wanted to go into it full time. And the rest is history. Right. So, did you just end up selling your facility? Is that how it started? Yeah, so I sold my facility in 2011, so five years ago, when I decided to go full-time into academia, it was just too much, and um, yeah. <clears throat> I must say it was liberating, because uh, as much as the American dream is to own your own business, and, and it was, look, I'm not putting, putting that down, it was a great experience for me, and it, it certainly at the time I got good self-actualization out of it, 
but it, it's a huge responsibility. Yes. I, I couldn't go away without worrying what was going on and having contact. And uh, it's, it really is uh, demanding in, in ways that people don't realize. And now it's, like I said, it's liberating. I'm, I'm able to go away now without having to worry about things. And it's easier. Yeah, no, no, I mean, I think you hit the nail right on the head. I think everybody's so quick to be like, you know what? I want my own facility, and it's just they don't think about it, like the overhead, the cost, everything you have to do. Yeah. Yep. Gotcha. Okay, so let's shift gears here a little bit. So let's say that um, for some reason you weren't able to do what you're doing currently now, um, Mm -hmm. and we had access to time-traveling machines, and you could travel back 20 years. What would you be doing instead of what you're doing? Yeah, so in college, my, my real passion was music. I got a, actually got a business degree with a minor in music, and I had really thought I was a keyboardist, uh, jazz piano, rock, blues, piano. I did some class. I mean, I basically everything music, and I was uh, key, keyboards were my main instrument. But I played some guitar, some harmonica, and uh, I had thought very seriously about going into it, but I had ultimately decided that uh, I didn't want to live with my parents till I was 40 teaching <laughs> piano in the hope that I'd hit it big in a band, which the chances were pretty much the same as hitting Lotto. We're fairly close to that. So anyway, bottom line was I, I figured I could always do music, which I still do. I, I play, uh, it's a relaxation uh, for me now, and I, I do have it as an avocation. But, uh, I, you know, if, if I could have, I, I probably would have done that. That's sure. awesome. Cool. <laughs> All right, so let's stick to this 20-year uh, subject that Eric brought up. So <clears throat> let's say we go back 20 years. What are three things you've learned that you could tell yourself today? That's a great question. Uh, so first I would say chase your passion, not money. Um, money is obviously it's great to have a lot of money, but we don't need you, – you can only drive one car at a time, live in one house. Um once you have your basic needs met, and for each person that's different, but you can certainly make sufficient money within most realms of your passion. I think what's, look, your, your job, you're going to be at your job, in most cases, more than you're with your family, at least as much. And if you're miserable or not happy at your job, uh, you're going to be a miserable person. I, when I was a trainer, I had so many millionaire wives and, and millionaire husbands uh, <laughs> who were uh, clients of mine, and they just were not happy in life. And we're making tons of money. So it's really being thrilled about what you do and and just having a passion for it, I think, is is imperative. Um, Another would be to be open-minded to everything but skeptical of everything. Um, It's uh, This is really the scientific method. So I was in the past very quick to just jump on fads when I wasn't as... uh, appreciative of the scientific method and I would hear a study come out and I'd say, ah, uh, antioxidants, you got to supplement with uh, a thousand milligrams of vitamin C a day, 400 IUs of vitamin E and that's, and then without really understanding the nuances of science. So you you need to be skeptical just because a study comes out showing something doesn't mean that it's, uh, that that's the be-all end-all. It doesn't. No study is ever a be-all end-all. And just because an authority says something, I used to there's a lot of people I still to look up to, but I'm skeptical. Just because they say something, don't take that as gospel. I tell my students, uh, as far as, you know, I'll give them my opinions on stuff, but challenge me. Yeah. Uh, I always uh, look to challenge and be skeptical and uh, make up your own opinion. Be an educated consumer and be an educated uh, scientist. And finally, I'd say get as much uh, education as possible, as early in life as possible. I, I do wish I'd gotten my PhD earlier in life, although it, I probably wouldn't have appreciated it as much, um, but it certainly gets harder as you uh, get more established in the field and have a career. Uh, and I would also say within the within the scope of that, you want to focus on learning, not on grades. Uh, grades will come, but I, I have been more focused, certainly in my undergrad years, uh, somewhat less in masters, but uh, definitely my undergrad years on just uh, getting my grades and. Uh, Really, it's about learning. Uh, Absorbing information. Exactly. And I think that if your focus is on that, the grades are going to come anyway, and uh, you'll retain. If you're just focused on getting grades, you don't retain anything. Right, exactly. Man, I I wish somebody would have told me that when I was in my undergrad. Seriously, I focused way too much on the grades, way too much. Yep. Yeah, and I think we uh, we focused like too much on black and white answers when we didn't realize there was so much gray area. So that's a couple things our our mentors taught us. So uh, it goes a long ways, to be honest. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So life, 
the beauty of life. So life is always testing us somehow, right? We're always, you know, getting curveballs thrown, having to face adversity, obstacles, all that great stuff. What are some challenges that you are facing right now in life? Um, well, right. I mean, my biggest challenge in life is that I'm technologically challenged. <laughs> Every time I have to deal with new equipment or uh, anything that's kind of computer based. Uh, More social right. media. Uh, yeah, even social media. That's why I like to have my uh, millennials around me as assistants. Yeah. To uh, they, they tend to be much more intuitive about that. Um, I, I mean, my main challenge in life, I think, is just fitting in everything I want to do. Uh, I am just so passionate about what I do, and there's just so much I want to accomplish that sometimes I do bite off a little more than I can chew. And trying to manage my time, I think, is the biggest challenge, yeah. so I can fit in everything that I want to do. Absolutely. Yeah, I think a lot of people have that issue. Um, so what would you say is the be one of the best investments you've made so far? Now, this could be something with time, energy, family, an actual investment, physical product, anything. Best investment, uh, without question, is getting my Ph.D. Um, it, it changed my life. Uh, first of all, it allowed me to work uh, full time in the field that I want of my choosing, which I wouldn't have been able to do. You need a Ph.D. to be a professor, at least at my school and at the vast majority. I wouldn't have been able to do that at any school that I'd want to go into. Um, and just the way people look at you and the, and the confidence that it instills in you, it's kind of weird. I was saying this to a friend of mine uh, just yesterday that um, I always had felt that people with PhDs had some intuitive knowledge that I would always be kind of deferential. Oh, my God, the person has a PhD must know all this. And once you do get to, to attain it, it gave me a certain self-confidence in myself. I always had good self-confidence anyway, but um, it, it just took me to a different level in terms of realizing that, number one, getting a PhD is a piece of paper in general just because someone does have it. It doesn't mean that they're any more knowledgeable. Put it this way, when I had right before I got my PhD, was awarded my PhD, I didn't know any more than like two days before my PhD, I just had a master's. I was the same person, had the same knowledge as the after. But uh, the knowledge that I did get, it, it just changed my life um, in terms of making me a real scholar. So what people don't appreciate, so from a knowledge perspective, in terms of training, like that's more what I was referring to. But being a research scholar, I, I'm just, was the ability to critically evaluate uh, scientific information, my, I went from a five to a 10, you know, basically. Uh, it just changed my life. So in just so many ways, getting my PhD was uh, really the most rewarding aspect and, and life-changing aspect of my career. Awesome. That's amazing. Wow. That's a huge accomplishment. And yeah, just the way you look at it or explain it is really, really cool too. Mm -hmm. uh, gotcha. Yeah. So Chris and I are very uh, big on structure and having systems. So what would you say, um, you know, the majority of structure and systems in your life are at right now and where you rely on them? Well, I, I'm a very structured person. So um, I, I get up very early in the morning. I'm generally up unless some something uh, gets in the way very occasionally, but I'm generally up by between 5 and 5.30 in the morning every day. Uh, I make my breakfast, I get to work, I, I'm, so I'm regimented and I, I keep lists. One of the things uh, that my dad always preached to me and I've taken this uh, to heart is to make lists and I work off my lists and prioritize my lists so that I'm doing the things most important first. Right. Uh, so I'm just, a, I think, a very structured person naturally and that uh, that does feed my ability to accomplish what I need to do. Yeah. So do you mind walking us through like kind of what your day looks like? So you wake up at 530, you have your breakfast. So what does the rest of the day look like? It, it's somewhat dependent on my, uh, if I'm teaching that day or not. And, and what, like in the summer I'm off. So I do different things. But I mean, let's say on a day that I do teach, it'll be, I'm up, uh, like I said, between 5 and 530, have my breakfast, walk my dog, I take my doggy for a two mile walk. I go, <laughs> beautiful pet bulldog, uh, Winston Churchill Schoenfeld, and I'll take him for a two-mile walk, then I'll come back, I'll uh, work I'll work off my list, I'll get whatever it is I need to do done. Usually I'm working, uh, I have to get into uh, school somewhere around noon, so I'll leave, it's about a half hour drive, leave around 11.30, then I'll advise students, generally then teach a class in the afternoon, uh, come back uh, in the middle of like, then I'm sorry, I also find time generally to work out. I work out four days a week at this point, so I'll fit in working out somewhere within that morning before I leave um, for, for school. 
uh, and then I'll have a, a lunch, quick lunch before that. Um, head, like I said, head to school. When I get back from school, usually it'll be around six o'clock or so, uh, somewhere around there, have dinner, and then uh, often get some more work done depending upon what I have to do. Usually I'll read at that point too. I try to put in uh, at least an hour to two hours a day uh, of re peer-reviewed reading, reading peer-reviewed papers, and uh, then usually watch a little TV and I'm off to bed. So. That's awesome, man. That's a great That's, that's a long routine. day. That's, yeah. It sounds like a constant grind. <laughs> yep. So the one question, one thing that caught my attention in there was with your lunch, does that fit the post-workout anabolic window? Oh, it does. It's funny. So um, <laughs> I, uh, as much as I'll trash on that, not that I scarf it down right at the gym, but uh, yeah. <laughs> I make myself a, uh, so I have the perfect post-workout meal. It's not a shake, but I have uh, uh, Faj Greek yogurt. Uh -huh. uh, with um, I put in mangoes, um, uh, so I, I buy the frozen mangoes that I defrost. I put in mangoes and then a scoop of Diamantized Whey protein vanilla, and to me that's like freaking ice cream. Yeah, absolutely. That's so funny, man. I got to tell you a story, and then the, the rest of the listeners. Uh, I remember Eric and I probably about ten years ago. We would bring like two pieces of white bread, a banana, and a shake with us to the gym and scarf it down like right when we got in the car. So. <laughs> It's just so funny the stuff that you used to do. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. All right, so let's 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 continue with this. So, what are some strengths that you have, or some weaknesses and flaws that you have right now that have turned into strengths in some capacity that are like really helping you out now? Um, you know, I don't think any weakness is helping me out. I think what I've been able to do is to diminish the weaknesses. So, I mean, one of the things that I had always had trouble with was delegating. I wanted to take on too much, and um, that inhibited my ability to accomplish what I needed to do. So I think really, to me, one of the things that I've worked on is being able to uh, tackle my weaknesses. And I've been more cognizant about delegating, getting more comfortable. I'm still depending upon what it is, have certain issues in that realm. Uh, but I have gotten a lot more comfortable in doing that and trusting that people are going to get the job done. And even if they don't get it done, perhaps as well as I think I would, I have to be able to deal with that or suffer the consequences of not accomplishing what I need to do. So uh, I'd say really it's more about focusing on the weaknesses and trying to tackle them. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So <laughs> pretty much this last question. So if someone gave you a billion dollars and they said, Brad, you have to you know, stop doing research, stop being a teacher. They took away your PhD. You couldn't personally train people. Um, you couldn't even do uh, music on the side. What would you see yourself doing? Let's say you agreed to that billion dollars that you had to agree. What would you see yourself doing? I, it's a moot question because like I, said, I mentioned earlier, all the money in the world to me isn't worth, uh, I, I can't think of anything. Now, I, I guess probably I'd have to. If someone put a gun to my head and said, this is, you know, you, I don't even know. I, it's a, something I wouldn't even ponder because I wake up every day jacked to do what I do. I, I, to me, I consider myself one of the luckiest people alive that I go into. I, literally, I wake up in the morning and I'm like, damn, I'm ready to tackle this day. And um, it's, I, I'm passionate about what I do. I feel like I'm making an impact, making a difference. Uh, and it's, uh, it's something I don't even give consideration to. Right? To think about doing something else is just really beyond my comprehension. So sorry to dish you there, but I, I just, there's nothing I can think of that would, uh, th that I would be passionate about uh, to anyone near the extent what I'm doing. And all the money in the world doesn't give you passion. Yeah. yeah. That, 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 go ahead. Go ahead. No, that's great because that's why we asked this question because I mean, it really does come down to what excites you the most, you know, what you do. And that's why we did this podcast to talk about these kind of things and to kind of encourage people to not think about the money, you know, Think about yep. mostly what excites you the most. So, yeah, exactly. All right, Brad. So we're we're digging into the rapid dynamic questions. So these these are kind of like rapid fire questions. You ready for that? <laughs> yeah. All right. Sure. So what are you doing currently, self development wise? Well, I'm always educating myself. As I mentioned, I spend uh, usually a couple of hours a day reading peer reviewed uh, literature. Uh, I do read textbooks, and um, I do I attend seminar when I I speak a lot and I listen. I'll attend seminars of other professionals. I talk to other professionals. And I'm actually going to be going back for a master's in statistics. I, I was planning on doing it uh, the coming semester, but my travel schedule is just a little crazy, so I'm postponing that until uh, the spring. But uh, I'm just constantly looking for ways to improve my self-education-wise. That's awesome. 
That's awesome. So I got a question, an add-on question on that. So you say you spend about two hours on reading research, right? So that's something I enjoy doing first thing in the morning is reading one study every single morning. Uh, how do you do that? Do you group them by, by topic or subject or is it just random? Yeah, it's right. I mean, so what I do is I get the ETOX uh, electronic table of contents from all the journals and I'll just find which I'll look, look them over and I'll pick out studies that are of interest to me. Mm -hmm. I also give a shout out to my great friend and, and colleague, Brett Contreras, who's always shooting me uh, studies, relevant studies that he thinks uh, would be of importance to me. And another one is Lyle McDonald, who does uh, the same, uh, another really great uh, educator in the field. So I have colleagues that are, are looking out for me too. And once I get them, I have them in a folder and I just kind of work out, work out of my folder. Yeah. And we'll give a shout out to Brad Schoenfeld, or sorry, Alan Aragon and James Krieger, the four uh, musketeers they call you guys. <laughs> Those, uh, me, Brett, Alan, and James yeah. are literally the, uh, we consider ourselves the fitness Avengers because uh, we are just so true to science and our mission is to educate people on on the realities on, on the realities of science and, and how they're applicable and also how they relate to practice because far too often uh, some scientists are just so hardened into the science they kind of lose sight of the fact the practical applicability of exactly. research findings so it's it's a melding of, of the art and the science and I think that's what we're really good at yeah you guys are doing an amazing job so keep it up Thanks. so next question if you could have dinner with one person this person could be anybody dead or alive who would that person be and why? Yeah, well, that question would be my dad. Uh, just He was passed away eight years ago. I was the biggest influence in my life. If I could get to spend one more evening with him, uh, I would be eternally grateful. Yeah, and I would have to agree with that, too. Our father passed away 12 years ago, too. So, uh, yeah, like you said, another day or anything, just a, even a dinner with him would be whew, dream come true. Yep. Yeah. All right, next question. So whenever you hear the word successful, who's the first person that comes to mind? Oh, there's so many. Uh, I'd hold out someone like Stephen Hawkins. Uh, I mean, to me, nothing is more monumental than changing the way we look at the world. So he, a guy like that is just, uh, he's just so out of the stratosphere from what I can envision uh, someone accomplishing. Like to me, that's the true success. It's not about the money. It's about your impact in the field. Yeah, yeah. that was an amazing movie, by the way, too. Very well. yeah. So what is your current training and nutrition looking like these days? Yeah, so I'm, uh, unfortunately with my current schedule, I don't, I'm not able to commit as much as I would like to, uh, to my training. I'm on a basic four day, usually it's four days. So I do an upper and lower split. Uh, I do train hard, but my sessions are quite brief. They're 45 minutes to an hour max. Uh, so I do short uh, sessions. I work the entire upper body one day. Uh, entire lower body another now occasionally I'll get more than four I'll get five in occasionally if I can and some days depending upon my uh, some weeks depending on my schedule I might only do three days uh, nutrition wise I'm very regimented I'll have I mean I can pretty much tell you my usual routine is uh, egg whites in the morning with an egg yolk usually thrown in and some salsa and vegetables uh, thrown in I have some oatmeal with fruit cut up and a big glass a big cup of coffee uh, I have uh, my post-workout shake is kind of a meal. Usually I have a snack that might be nuts or sometimes a protein bar. Then I'll have a large dinner, usually protein with a baked potato and some veggies. And then I'll have uh, dessert. And usually I'll, pretty much every night I'll have a glass of wine with that. Uh, wine is kind of my, my thing. Uh, I get that resveratrol in. That's what I convince myself that a glass of wine is not the resveratrol. And uh, often I'll have uh, a cappuccino with uh, some dark chocolate and some berries for dessert. So that's kind of a typical day. And I, I do indulge. I'm not nearly as uh, I used to be so anal about uh, keeping 6% body fat, which I did for many, many years. I yeah. mean, I'm around shredded all the time. And now I'm probably up around 9 or 10%. And I'm just comfortable with that. I, I'll go out for dinner uh, usually a couple of times a week and uh, I'll, I'll splurge. I have no issue with having cheat, what you might call cheat meals and uh, indulging. So, uh, you know, got one life and I'm whether it's 6% body fat or 9% body fat, you don't take that with you. So as long as I'm lean, I can look in the mirror and be happy. I'm, I'm cool. Absolutely. Is, uh, and your, your website is uh, to look good naked. So look no, great. No, 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 hold on. It's to look great naked. Look great naked. So there yeah, you go. We don't superlatives. <laughs> look great naked. Just 
And by the way, I look good naked from what I hear as a porn site, so you don't oh, want to okay, gotcha. <laughs> go there and give that to That's someone. That's Eric's favorite, gotcha. <laughs> so I have to ask, too, within your training, I know you and Brett are just great friends, but uh, does do you, are you a fan of the hip thrust movement? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Nice. I, 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 I include hip thrust. First of all, I've collaborated with Brad. I was actually on his yes. dissertation chair. I was a, on his dissertation committee. We uh, did a lot of studies, or I was part of his studies uh, on hip thrusts. And uh, yeah, look to me, exercises are all tools. Uh, I use. There are some that I tend to use more than others myself, but it really comes down to preference and uh, your goals, etc. What you're looking to do. So I, I generally subscribe to the uh, opinion that there's no such thing as a bad exercise, or almost. No such thing as a bad exercise, just poor application for a given person. Gotcha. All right. Gotcha. All right. So what does Brad like to do for fun? So we see the Facebook pictures of the wine, the pizza. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I live in New York. I'm a big city guy. I love to uh, enjoy all that Manhattan has to offer. So I, I go to, uh, I'm very cultural, uh, cultured. I, I go to museums. I love jazz. I go to jazz clubs. I do restaurants a lot. Um, just really a, a lot. I think really taking advantage of what the city has to offer, uh, and also I do like to travel. Yeah, so I, I'm uh, fortunate to speak internationally, and I usually will try to take an, a couple of days extra to see the countries, and that's certainly something I enjoy doing. Absolutely. What are what are some of your uh, travel destinations that are on your bucket list? Oh boy. So uh, yeah, I'm going to Toronto next month uh, and Norway next month, and I go to Germany, to Copenhagen, Denmark, to. Uh, Bologna, Italy, um, to Jeez. Madrid, Spain, then Rome, Italy, then Japan, uh, Cyprus, Australia, and um, uh, there's another one in there somewhere. But anyway, uh, yeah, it's a pretty busy schedule. And, and actually, I'm also doing uh, Fort Lauderdale, not Fort Lauderdale, uh, Jacksonville, Florida, uh, for the NSCA uh, conference, and uh, Arizona for the uh, for NSCA regional. So, <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. awesome. Chris and I have to step up our travel game. <laughs> Um, okay, so what are you most grateful for and why right now? I'm most grateful for my position in life. Uh, I, I just get so much satisfaction out of what I do and um, just the accolades that I've gotten from people, how I've helped to change their lives. Um, I, I, again, that to me, it's about self-actualization and I'm, um, I'm just very grateful that I'm in a position to do what I love doing and to impact so many different lives. Okay, Brad, so last question that we do with all of our, uh, you know, uh, guests is, what is your definition of living a dynamic lifestyle? Dynamic. Uh, well, I'm, dynamic to me is just movement. Uh, I, I mean, I, again, lifestyle, I, I would say my philosophy is a lot of life is that we were on this earth a short period of time and that we should look to maximize the impact that we have on society in some way or, or look within our own sphere. So that could just be on your family, it depends what your scope is, but it could just be on your family, it could be my, my, uh, my goals are more uh, broad in that respect, so I want to have an impact really on as many people as possible. But I think really making an impact is my definition of, of life, what we're here to do. So that would be... Not sure how that relates to dynamic per se, but that would be my definition of, of what I think my lifestyle is about. Gotcha. That's a great definition. All right, Brad. So Eric and I just want to take the time to acknowledge you. Um, I don't think you get enough acknowledgement. And, you know, we've met a couple of times and, you know, we've looked at you as a mentor, you know, these past probably five, six years uh, with us growing as, you know, coaches and in the fitness industry. And a lot of people think with mentors that you have to have somebody there one to one. But that's not necessarily true. You know, uh, we've learned through you through just like going to your conferences, watching your videos, reading your articles, books. reading your research, your books. So I just want to acknowledge you and say thank you so much. You've helped me be a better coach and you've just, you know, furthered my knowledge to another level. Well, thank you. And that goes to what I had said before about what, what I appreciate is making an impact. And I thus appreciate the sentiments really are appreciated because that's what fulfills me. Yeah, awesome. and likewise for me, man, uh, Chris always steals my words first, so that's hard to talk. But, yeah, thank you so much for everything you do. Terrific, guys. All right, so where can our listeners go and uh, read your blogs, everything else? And Sure. Yeah, well, my, my website is lookgreatnaked.com. I have an active blog on there. I'm very active on social media, so people can follow me on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. 
Uh, I'm very active on social media. I like to, I'm an educator, so I like to disseminate information, to have discussion, to have discourse, and that way everyone learns. So uh, follow me uh, on social media, check out my blog, and uh, look forward to interacting. All right, guys, so we'll have all that in the show notes for you as well as Brad's new book right here. Pick it up, and we'll have that in the show notes as well. All right, Brad, well, thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Brad. All right, guys. All right, have a good one, man.